Um, so we're really excited to have uh, Deepak Pathak here today. Um, Deepak did his uh, PhD in Berkeley, uh, mostly working on uh, self-supervised learning and computer vision, um, and also with applications to reinforcement learning. Um, and I think since then, he's, he's gone straight on to uh, Carnegie Mellon, where he's now uh, an assistant professor in the School of Computer Science. Um, so yeah, we're really excited uh, to have here as talk today. Okay, so let me start with sharing the screen. Oh, sorry, let me, let me share again and Okay, uh, just to double check once again, you guys can shame, see my screen, correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sounds good. So uh, thank you uh, for the introduction and uh, having me to give a talk here. And uh, today I will talk about uh, general purpose robot learning, uh, where our goal is to uh, build robots that can adapt to diverse environment and diverse tasks. So what is the long-term goal of robot learning? Well, the, the long-term goal is to achieve this general purpose embodied intelligence, okay? Now, but what does that mean, this general purpose thing? So consider the robot below. When it is introduced to a new environment, it should be able to achieve all the goals that the user gives to it. For instance, cooking, shopping, or fixing things. In other words, we want the robots that can do thousands of tasks in thousands of environments, okay? They should be able to generalize to tasks as well as new environments or new home they are introduced to. But this goal, unfortunately, is very far from where things are today. Most of the successful results in today's literature are focused on solving one task in one environment. And it is difficult to generalize from one scenario to other, like playing Go to, I don't know, grasping objects, for instance. So this generalization problem is not just an issue in robot learning but it has been pervasive in all forms of learning. So let's consider the simplest case, that is supervised learning. So let's uh, take this example here. Here we take this example of image classification, where image is input and we train a model to classify it, let's say Labrador. The way this model is trained is by showing it lots and lots of images of dogs, which come from a big data set, which is split into training and test. Okay. Now here is a result uh, which is uh, widely known, and kind of put deep learning on the map of machine learning community. And this works really well. And, uh, but let us see how well this, like this result is glorious result in success of deep learning, correct? Let us see how does this result generalize to something else. So I take the best model out there, which is ResNet uh, model, like one of the uh, very high performing ones, ResNet 50. And I test it on this video from YouTube. So not too far, like just, uh, 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 from images to videos. And this model, which achieves superhuman performance on ImageNet, finds things like cobra snake, ray fish, flat worm, right? So what's going on? Why, how did this model completely fail to generalize from superhuman accuracy to nearly 20% accuracy on these videos and finding this spurious uh, output? Well, if you discuss this with a computer vision person, the answer won't be very surprising. For instance, we know that in ImageNet, the photos of dogs, et cetera, are like center of image, good angle, uh, large in size, et cetera. Even though we have million images, the diversity is biased, hence the model doesn't generalize. But to me personally, this highlights a big issue uh, in, in the way we approach learning, not just robot learning, but any form of learning uh, in the community. And the issue is as follows. In any machine learning book, the, every machine learning book starts with this assumption that let's assume that training data and test data come from same distribution. And this is a big assumption, which is violated almost all the time in the real world. And when that happens, things fail to generalize. Extending the same analogy to control, the robotic system that can do very one task very really well, like parlor tricks here, completely fail to adapt to other tasks, which are maybe, you can say simpler, like putting a box block on the tabletop. And in robotics, the failures are more catastrophic. Like you can lose thousands of dollars in one failure, uh, unlike classifying a dog into a cat or something. 
So the question is, how do we go uh, from this paradigm and generalize beyond what the agent is trained for? And uh, what I argue is that we want to do away from this current paradigm of training, freezing weights, and then testing, and then just hoping that the things work out at testing. Instead of that, uh, research in my group uh, takes inspiration from the way things happen in nature, where almost all the biological agents adapt continuously and rapidly throughout their life uh, on their own. And the question is, how do we go from this current paradigm of training versus testing to this continual adaptation loop that we, that we see in nature all the time? Okay. And in this talk, I will particularly focus on how to computationalize this idea of adaptation. Like, what does it mean to adapt in real time at, uh, in the real world at test time and not really at training time? Okay. Now, I uh, mentioned this generic problem of trying to uh, build robots that can do thousands of tasks in thousands of environments. And the question is, uh, do we tackle that whole problem at once? So for the purpose of this talk, let us break down our initial goal or initial grand goal of building thousand tasks, thousand environment robots into two sub problems. The first sub problem is let's consider same task, but diverse environment. So pick a task and see if you can build robot that can generalize to diverse environments for that task. And the second sub problem will be having same environment, but doing diversity of tasks in that environment. And as you can see, we need interaction of both of these sub problems to solve our grand goal of general purpose robotics. So to, in today's talk, I'll give ideas for both of these setups and then talk about the uh, directions going forward. In the first setup, I'll focus on uh, robots which are mobile, which can go around uh, and, and walk and, and navigate. In, because you have to go to a diverse environment. In the second case, I'll talk about robots that can do diversity of tasks, like robotic arm, which are very dexterous, et cetera. Okay. So let's focus on the first sub-problem. And by the way, feel free to interrupt me anytime and ask any questions or anything you are not happy with. Okay, so moving forward. So let me concretize this first sub-problem, which is same task, diverse environment. So we will consider a robot, it could, be, uh, it could be a legged robot like here. And our goal is make this robot walk or solve several tasks, the same task in a, in a huge diversity of environment. And the goal is to adapt to these environments in real time. So we want to look at this idea of adaptation in the context of this first subproblem. Okay. More concretely, I talk about uh, the, the paper which was just uh, published at RSS. Uh, we call it rapid motor adaptation. And this is centered around the same philosophy. Before I talk about the idea, let us see some results in here uh, where this robot is being tested in diverse environment in the real world. Note this was trained only in simulation and this and here I'll first motivate it by showing results. And the key idea here is that the robot is adapting at test time to these new terrains. It has never been trained here. You can see it is trying to walk on a difficult terrain and it encounters some obstacle and it has learned to move its leg up and move, keep moving forward. Here, the robot is introduced to a stair path. Note the robot was never trained on stairs. It has never seen stairs and uh, uh, not even with this environment because they only only it. This is a test time result where the robot is able to adapt. Now the robot is blind. Right now, it, only, it is only working from its uh, sensors, but even if it had sensors, it would have to still avoid this pitch or like this dip in the, in the, in the ground without using some vision because this cannot be seen. There's a dip in there. Here is a more result of robot mocking in the target areas. One more result, here the ground is deformable. So the robot has to walk such a way that it can, does not fall uh, and the legs are very thin. One more is a wet ground with mud, and mud sinks into the ground when you need to place your foot. And the impressive part here is that this is robot is not trained for any of the situation. It is adapting at test time directly on its own. And it adapts in real time. So adaptation is happening while it is doing it for. It's walking on the beach. Now beach is hard for a uh, robot because it has very thin legs and sand or sand is granular. While humans have feet, which has a large surface area, so it's easier for humans. And 
This was a single policy working in all the territories, trained in neither of them and adapting to all of them in the real time, as you see in the video, without any supervision. So let us see now, how do you build such a robust and adaptive policy? And what is this mechanism of adaptation that works, that is working, <coughs> that is in works here? Sorry, it's morning time, so my voice is slightly <coughs> rough, so keep drinking water. <coughs> okay, so let us see uh, how to learn to walk in simulation, <coughs> and then how will we generalize this to beyond simulation to real world. So first we train a policy that can work really well in simulation. We call it base policy, okay? This is the basic policy which should have walking behavior. How do we train this? Well, it takes the input of the current state of the robot, like xt80 minus one, and it outputs 80, like the next action that the robot should take. And we randomize the environment in simulation uh, by changing terrain height, et cetera. Now we want the simulation policy to be as good as possible, like really good. So what we do is we condition it on the exact environment conditions that the robot is walking on. And we encode those conditions into this latent vector Z, and then we trade this base policy, okay? Now we call this extrinsic vector because this is encoding the extrinsic value. So extrinsic is ex the environment parameter. Intrinsic is agent's own state like xt. So intrinsics go here, extrinsics come from here, and we condition this policy to take this. Now in the simulation, we randomize the uh, domain, but note that this approach is opposite of the popular approach known as domain randomization. It's opposite of that. We are not trying to train a single generic policy that works well on all the environments, no. But we are trying to train an adaptive policy that is conditioned on the environment. So, we, so the policy knows what it, what it is dealing with, okay? So you're not trying invariance, you are trying conditioning. Not invariance, conditioning. So this is a key distinction here. So it's opposite of domain randomization, okay? Now we take this with reinforcement learning, very simple with reward function. And this is how the terrain looks like. You can see the terrain is uh, uh, like rough and we change the height, width of this terrain. That's it. No stairs, nothing else, okay? Now, how do you deploy this policy in the real? Well, to deploy this policy, what you need is access to the extrinsics. But these extrinsics are not available in the real world because these environment values are not available, like mass, center of mass, friction, time, height, meter strength. These things are not available in the real world, okay? So what do we do? Like, how do we deploy this uh, policy uh, in the real world? Now note that this question is not a sim to real gap question because this extrinsics vector, even if we could estimate this in the real world for a real, for a real setting, these values may change at every instant. Like I move forward, I don't know, a sand block comes in and I have to now avoid that sand block or something. So these values have to be estimated in the real world at every point in time. So this is not a sim to real gap. This is actually uh, uh, a question of how do you uh, get these values? Now here is how we formulate this idea of adaptation. And the key insight here is that we want to estimate these extrinsics value from the history of agent's own experiences, okay? So we will estimate this uh, extrinsic value online. And what we will take as input is, the, is its own history, like XT, like last 50 steps of history, for instance. Now, why is history useful to estimate the extrinsics? The intuition is as follows, that uh, let us say you command robot some, some command, hey robot, go, go at this joint angle, et cetera. Now, when the robot goes at those joint angle, et cetera, the actual joint angles in the real world may be different from what you commanded. Now, the difference or the discrepancy between what is expected and what is actual is only due to the fact that the environment is affecting the robot. So this difference should have a signal as to how to estimate the environment, as how to estimate these extrinsics, okay? So what we do is we train an adaptation module which takes the history and outputs these extrinsics. And once you have this module, you can actually run it online. Like you can continuously estimate these extrinsics and not even keep, not keep them fixed for the same environment, but keep assuming them online, okay? Now, uh, 
Let me summarize how do we train this model. So let's focus on phase one. I already discussed that phase one is reinforcement learning. It takes the environment as input and it encodes these environment values and outputs ZT and train this base policy. So all the modules in red are trained. So in phase one, you train base policy via policy gradient and the gradients flow back to the encoder and you also train the encoder, okay? So both of these boxes are trained together via reinforcement learning. Now, one thing to note here is that we are deploying learning from scratch. So as in the uh, policy takes in the current state and observ observation and directly outputs the action and the actions joint angles. We are not going to use any predefined motion, like no leg swing motion, no demonstration, no reference trajectory, no control. Okay. So this is a this is a, we are only using PID control at the very bottom, but PID is like very age old thing, it's hundred years old. So nobody cares about PID. But we are not using any uh, foot trajectory optimizer that is very common in the literature that people use for for walking because walking is like a sine wave motion. You can use sine wave etc. But none of that. It's very simple directly go from input to output where output is all the way joint movements okay so you can ask you a question reinforcement learning. uh just yes um so the uh in the phase two the adaptation model is, is being trained online is that is that right yeah so i'm, I'm coming to that uh, let me explain oh, okay. phase two. Okay. so phase one is reinforcement learning then phase two on the in contrast is actually just a regression problem this is supervised learning so in phase two, after you have been trained phase one, you freeze the base policy and you only train adaptation module. So phase two happens after phase one. So in phase two, what you do is you collect data in simulation and you say that the output of this module, which takes history and goes to Z hat T, it should uh, match the output uh, of the environment encoder. And you have this target in simulation because in simulation, all these parameters are known to you. Okay, so you can just do a regression problem in simulation. Now I can take the question. Um, yeah, sorry. So I guess I was just uh, curious about how is, so is this adaptation module, how is it trained uh, fast enough online? You know, are you so actually updating weights in the adaptation yeah, so module? I, no, 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 you are not updating. So this is this is currently everything in simulation, right? So yeah. you, train, you train this, uh, the, these two things via in, in simulation, mm -hmm. uh, via reinforcement learning, then you train adaptation module in simulation via oh, uh, uh, supervised learning. Mm -hmm. Then what you do at deployment time, you put them together. You throw away this, you throw away this one. This is not used. And then at uh -huh. test time, you just put adaptation module with the base policy. Okay, now, okay. what is happening in the real world is this adaptation module is continuously inferring the Z. Mm -hmm. Now Z is conditioning, uh, so base policy is conditioned on Z. So this is, but this Z is being updated online at a very high frequency, right. Okay. right? And this is what I call rapid adaptation. So this Z is adapting rapidly in the real world. Okay. Now there are many nice properties of this two phase algorithm. Like first nice property is that the base policy and the adaptation module can run at different speed. Like in human body, uh, if you, uh, uh, like in humans, low level control, like walking, it's like, like if I push you, uh, you will fall backward, but you will balance yourself with your feet, right? 90% um, of the time. So that control is happening from your spinal cord. And that's very, very high frequency. Like you don't use vision in that because vision is very slow. So vision can come at a lower frequency. So similarly, processing history may take time. So it's lower frequency. It can happen at any a lower speed. And the base policy can happen at a very high speed. And these two things are completely asynchronous. And for uh, since it's two phase, base policy uses the recent outcome of adaptation module. And there is uh, no synchronization required. So it's completely asynchronous. Okay. That's one point. The second main point is that even though in simulation, like in simulation, this value is constant for an episode, right? When you sample the environment, mass, friction, et cetera, these all remain the same. So this value is constant. But in the real world, we can actually keep inferring this value in every time step. Like even when the robot is walking on sand, you can keep estimating the ZT online. Now, why is this crucial? Because note that the sand friction, et cetera, may remain same overall, 
but how it affects the robot, that value, that functional, the effect of sand on the robot is changing continuously as the robot is walking on it. It depends on its shape, how much, like is how many legs are in the air, etc. So estimating this continuously online uh, is uh, a second nice property of this. So asynchronous and continuous adaptation. These two are the properties that fall out of the fact that these, this algorithm was two phase. So this is one scenario where end to end is actually like uh, not doing end to end actually is an advantage because it gives you very nice practical benefits. Okay. Um, so let us see some indoor evaluation of this approach. So here, uh, so I showed outdoor before, and now we are showing indoor and more difficult settings in some ways. So here the robot is walking. Now note that as it is walking, the planks are moving. So it's pretty hard to balance yourself, uh, especially because you saw what the simulation looked like. Simulation is very different from, from any of this, right? Simulation was uh, just this, like this, this terrain and nothing else. And so it's, it's a bit a uh, hard problem to adapt to this. And you can see why continuous adaptation is useful because what you infer here may not hold here when the block moves. You're also putting it on mattress. Like we cannot simulate mattress in the simulation because it's a soft one now and the force feedback is noisy, but the robot it is fine and can, can move forward. Here, the surface is oily, it can move forward. I'll show more results of this and throwing weights on this. Overall, uh, the uh, algorithm is very robust and we have tested it very heavily on a large number of indoor experiments. And this work was done during pandemic. So this is the living room uh, of Ashish, uh, uh, who is the first author. And this living room used to be my living room many years ago when I was in So uh, you can see uh, that it works really well. Now let's compare this idea to a control-based approach. So here we compare to Avon's built-in controller because this robot comes up with a controller. And that control is kind of based off, uh, we don't know for sure, but our guess is it is based off convex MPC from Sunbay Kim's lab at MIT. So top one is control algorithm, bottom one is adaptation, RMA. So you can see the leg movement here actually. See how structured it is, like tick, 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 because most of the work in literature encode the motion of the legs uh, in the algorithm. Okay, but there's a gap, so it fails to then adapt. And you can see there is no such tick tick motion in our, in our robot because we have not hard coded it. It's completely emerged from scratch. Again, it's controlled with method. It gets completely thrown off if there is not tick tick and there is it. Now, one thing is that when we tested this robot, maybe the controller was not this bad in the beginning. There is mattress. Uh, and mattress does not give, give you force feedback. So the control algorithm gets completely thrown off in the very in the very beginning. And without even force feedback, our method can do really well. Now, what I was saying, like in the beginning, the robot probably was not this bad, but after our thorough testing, the robot broke multiple times. So that could have thrown off the control algorithm, but our algorithm can adapt. And that's one of the key part. Like even if the robots get damaged or become noisy, you can still keep adapting and do well. Okay. Now here is uh, uh, the, let's compare now, what is the role of adaptation in this setup? How critical is this part of adaptation? So on the top, uh, what I show is uh, RMA, the full algorithm and bottom we'll show without adaptation. What if you have the same thing, every, like all everything, but you don't adapt online, like I was showing you, is critical, okay? And here you're adding eight PG payload while the robot is popping. Now note that robot is very small, it's only 12 kg, and you're adding eight kg on top. So if your weight is, let's say 100 kg, you are adding 80 kg or like 70 kg on top of you while walking. It's a very hard problem. And the robot was not trained for this. Again, this is all adaptation. And if you do not have this adaptation, or you only infer once in the beginning, this happens. This was a very hard fall. Like if you notice it, the robot really fell hard on the ground. Uh, and I think this, this kind of might have broken the robot. Uh, but we still kept testing for the sake of time. It is mattress, it's going to work very well. But without adaptation, it fails to get And let's test even more further. Like, even harder scenarios. So here is one. Um, so where we have this surface 
and we add oil on the surface to make it really hard to walk and very thoroughly oil it up completely uh, and this will be using olive oil <laughs> apparently academia is rich um, uh, here is we also add plastic on the feet of the robots that it slips the maximum let's see how well it did so okay it's like oh it's slipping a lot of things in balance so that was very quick let's see in slow motion look at this now it's almost slipping about to fall but it's still learning to balance itself and you can actually see this behavior happening in the adaptation uh, uh, extrinsic vector so here we are showing the dimension first and five so this for this experiment these two dimensions were the most prominent first and fifth okay and as the robot walks as it slips and adapts you can see that the behavior of the z changes here and uh, it adapts as the robot is walk this is kind of interesting you can actually visualize the changes one more example of throwing the weight on top this is even harder so you are throwing 5 kg weight i did this experiment with my students when they were walking and and threw this weight on top of them and it was very really hard to catch it while walking and and keep walking this is uh, because its impact is much higher than 5 kg it seems slow motion pay attention here how the robot adapts such a nice bend going downwards like an animal and i really like this uh, this uh, is a repetition piece here this yeah. and again and for this experiment z2 and z7 were the most prominent and when you visualize them you can see in the beginning they are both the same as the robot gets the as the weight comes on top z2 becomes high z7 becomes low so you can actually see the change in there uh, happening with the robot so locomotion has been studied a lot uh, right uh, we have seen like all this prior work from boston dynamics and uh, control methods from labs from upen eth uh, even learning based methods even centurial uh, this is from berkeley uh, meta learning etc so uh, how well does rma compare to all of them so what we did very thorough experimentation we picked a baseline from each of these paradigms and we compared to that and we found rma to be really uh, good um, and we did the testing the comparison not only in simulation but also in real world and it's much harder and much time taking so it almost took two months to do the experiments just the experiments uh, so the paper was ready like two months before and we all only did experiments for the two months so in the context of prior work what are the key exciting takeaways from this rma work first is it is functioning without any hand coded or heuristic control stack so there is no uh, uh, leg motion etc that defined second the generalization it is adapting to new things with limited training and third is this asynchronous design so the main contribution is rapid motor adaptation and the way we do this enables these three advantages which i think are big takeaways from uh, the way things are done the way things are done in the literature especially this first one like uh, so not having uh, this leg motion allows the emergence of behavior to avoid obstacle So you can see here, the robot is blind, so it has learned to kind of avoid obstacle by slowly moving its leg upward. So look at this in slow motion. So it is blind, so it can actually leg move its leg upward uh, to avoid the obstacle. So it has learned this behavior automatically, and it will avoid it. It's the same in slow motion. And here is uh, one more example where the both legs are stretched. So keep trying and then go forward by. Okay. Now, what? So apart from this benefit of like avoiding obstacles, etc., one of our uh, main motivation for not hard coding any of these things is actually the inspiration from how locomotion works in babies and in humans. So Karen Adolf, she's a professor at NYU, and she was student of Eleanor Gibson, who did this famous uh, visual cliff experiment. and she has be uh, karen is now the world authority on uh, locomotion in humans and uh, one of her paper i really like this part she argues that uh, the notion of gates that we are used to thinking of like in horses dogs etc like gallop walk canter etc which robotics people have been hard coding it uh, for the last uh, many years these gates do not exist in babies like the gates in real life are all over the place and this is uh, and uh, 
just few gates don't define general purpose locomotion. And that's what really inspired us. And so we did the same thing. We did not hard code any gate and then we learned uh, completely from scratch. But we know that this story is nice and good, but this is not completely true because animals do display very structured gates like walking, amble, pace, trot, canter, gallop. And they have been studied by many people over the years, like Hildebrand, uh, 1965, like this study of gates and horses. So why is this a discrepancy? Why like one person is saying it's complex, like uh, no gates, unstructured gates, and then people study gates and animals. So one thing to look at is that most of these studies on the left are done on complex terrain when there is no structured gates. So when I say no gate, I mean structured gates. On the right, animals show this behavior only on simpler terrain. But if you see animals in complex terrain, there is also no structured gate. And that has been studied as well in the later works. Right? So how do we reconcile both of these ideas of complex and simpler terrain and get these emergence of gate? So this is this is like a really a scientific question here, not an engineering problem. Anymore. So it's a slight digression from the talk. Okay. So before we do that, let's kind of imagine. So we have this kind of result in RNA, but what about this? So why do animals have these gates? Like why do they walk, trot, etc.? There are many hypotheses in biomechanics in the last hundred years or so. And one of the most interesting that I like is this is this one, where they say energy may be the reason that uh, animals have these uh, gates. So here is a plot from 1980s, 81. And here they measure the energy of the horse by measuring oxygen on y-axis and the speed of the horse on the x-axis. And we can see as the speed increases, different gates show become highly energy inefficient. So like walking has low energy only at certain speed, which is low speed. At high speed, it, it's very inefficient. It's a, it's a bell curve. Similarly, trotting is only optimal at medium speed, not at low or high speed. And at high speed, gallop is the most efficient. So this will be the reason that animals have evolved to conserve energy and that they show this gait. Now, can we use this insight to build robots which can capture this whole range? So what we did in this work, we minimize energy consumption in the same framework. So what does this mean? So in addition to walking forward, we say, okay, hey robot, you should also conserve your energy. So only two things, walk forward and conserve energy or not to conserve, sorry, minimize energy. Okay. And we found that to our surprise that when we do that on simpler terrain, so this terrain is simpler than before, like it's not spiky, et cetera. Uh, it's like smooth uh, and uh, not that very. So on simpler terrains at different speeds, different gates emerge. At low speed walking emerges at high speed, uh, trotting at very high speed bouncing, which is gallop, when we deploy in the real world. So now you can see the good patterns after energy minimization actually are very structured. At low speed it is walking, I don't know, like a very simple walk. Then at medium speed it trots. The trotting is where the rear legs are uh, tracking the uh, front legs. At super high speed it bounces, it's like, like a teacher kind of movement when, when horses are running. And there is a flight phase that has emerged. Note that here. All the four legs are in the air. Now, this flight phase is very hard to hard code from control, etc. So this is considered a good result when you have a flight phase in the, in the robot. And here is the foot pattern of all of these. Walk, trot, bounce. Uh, and the these plots are a standard way of plotting gates. And uh, we are showing them in a slow motion because they are very fast. Okay. Now, what about animals? Like, how does this connect to animals? So, what we actually found that so we used to call it a robot dog, and everyone everyone calls it a robot dog. But there is something called Froude number which measures or which gives you a scalar value characterizing the gait of the robot, whether it's uh, uh, with respect to the shape, body, and animals. And we found that. Our robot is actually similar to sheep and horses, like more close to horse than a dog. And because it's proud number is similar to horses. And as in horses, the same trend holds here. At low speed, it walks, then it trot, then it gallops, which is bounce. Right? And we can we found a similar energy profile uh, for the horses. Now, note that y-axis is not exactly similar because we are using mechanical energy, uh, while in horses, it's oxygen. So we should also, also be measuring like the amount of electricity used, et cetera. But that's a bit hard to measure. So we are not showing that. So it's not exactly comparable, 
But note the trend is similar, as in low speed walk, then trot, then bounce, which is kind of uh, very nice to see in the same framework. And these gates are robust. Again, you can walk through grass. Even though this was simpler terrain digger, this is still robust. You can add weight as before. This is still uh, robust. You can walk through bushes. The bushes are hard, the leg gets stuck, but it maintains its gait. You can bounce through the grass. There can also be human, which is disrupting the robot while it is walking. So it pulls it sideways, since it's about, about to fall. Actually, it's in slow motion. Okay. When the human pulls it sideways, the robot is almost about to fall. It balances its face. When the human pulls it upwards, uh, the robot can still maintain its gait. Okay. Now, when we repeat the same procedure in complex terrain, uh, as I said before, in complex terrain, uh, gates are unstructured. So we found the same thing, like at comp the same architecture, and we change it into more complex. The gates are unstructured at any speed. They don't have any structure like before, which is consistent with what we found in the if they are unstructured. There's no walking, trotting, etc. It's all over, it's all over the place. And if you plot it, it looks like that. Okay. So this was the study on uh, first sub problem where we were focusing on uh, same task but diverse environment. Okay. Now let's change gears slightly and talk about what happens if we have same environment but diverse task. Uh, and this is in a way I would say a bit more challenging problem because generalizing to diverse tasks is kind of what we can see we define intelligence, like coming up with new goals or solving new goals. Okay, So this is a, uh, a more ambitious setup. But uh, before I talk about this, let me first talk about how do people train an agent to solve a single task today? Not diverse task, single task in one environment. Because this is what I said in the beginning. This is what people do today, mostly. right? So the first popular approach in robotics is, is imitation learning. This is the exact equivalent of supervised learning uh, in, in, in ImageNet, where you collect exact data, how the robot should move, what should be the angles for every new task. And you can see this is tedious for the expert. You have to label and collect it manually. But the biggest problem is that this has to be repeated for every new task that the robot is introduced to. This is not scalable. You cannot solve thousands of tasks with this approach. Second approach is reinforcement learning, et cetera, where you design a reward function and uh, can solve uh, many of these tasks. But again, the same problem here. Uh, the problem is that you have to design the reward function for every new environment. So this is, again, not scalable. You have to keep defining the reward functions. Okay. Now, the only approach I think is scalable to solving thousands of tasks uh, and discover them is if the agent discovers them on their own. Like, if there is an agent that is continuously learning by itself, you go to office, the robot is in home, it is discovering things on its own. And then you, when you come back from office, you say, hey robot, can you fetch me a beer? It goes and does that automatically. Okay. That's what we want. The only solution to this is this problem of uh, diversity of tasks is to keep discovering them continuously 24 seven on, on your own. And this is the idea we conceptualize in this recent paper which we call discovering and achieving goals with world models. Okay. Now, what is the setup? Setup is at training time, you do self-supervised learning where you discover goals in a, on your own. Then at test time, you, a human will come and show you a goal image and you have to just solve the goal from there. Okay. Many challenges here. You have to not only discover the goal on, on your own at training time, but you have to also learn to achieve them. And all of this should happen from images, from raw data, so that it's easy to specify a test time. Images or language, it could be done, but not assuming access to the state space of, or the world of the robot. And this is an area which is very crowded. In a way, there are a lot of papers out there. Uh, and uh, the main issue uh, with the papers is that they are either functioning from a state space, which is they assume the knowledge of the full world uh, state, which is weird, which is not good, or uh, they only discover skills and not generalize to new things. But there is a bigger problem. Like if you want a robot that can discover thousands of tasks on its own, that robot has to be really efficient. Like 
you do not want to come home to see that the robot is stuck at a corner of uh, of your room trying to i don't know scratch the surface because scratching surface is very very good so it gets curious about that you don't want that you would want it to be really efficient in coming up with goals and really discover diverse scenarios however all the approaches in the literature all the pair approaches uh, fall into this paradigm where the way expression work it is retrospective what do i mean by that so let's say here is a robot this is just a high level overview what do we do is we come up with a goal for this robot so we sample a goal okay and the way we sample a goal is based on your prior information so you can sample a new goal by building a generative model or by doing curiosity which uh, this prediction error like uh, try to find scenarios where the error is high and you come up with this goal okay now when you sample a goal then you try to what you try to do is you try to achieve that goal uh, and while trying to achieve it you increase your frontier on that side slightly so you all these ex methods are exploring near the frontier so whatever you have explored you poke the frontier boundary on all sides but if we want this robot to be efficient we would like to explore beyond the frontier and really come up with new things that the robot has not seen yet okay so uh, to achieve lots of tasks we need the expression to be efficient and efficient expression means exploring beyond the frontier and not just poking the frontier slowly but the problem is like how do i imagine a goal or how do i discover a goal that i have not seen yet like how do i go even beyond the frontier because frontier by definition is the place what i have seen so how do you generate something new what are what and and, the, and this is where all the papers uh, fall like all the prior papers fall what they do is they they build a generative model and they sample from it but a generative model by by definition cannot sample things that are outside the distribution of what you have seen because that's a definition of generative model so we are already stuck there so what our solution is is to completely sidestep this problem and propose propose a new approach of looking at it okay. so i'll just give an intuition in the talk what's the high level idea so here is a, here is my robot okay so what this robot will do so it will not build a genetic model etc it will build a world model okay now what is a world model world model is basically saying from my past data i will build a model which takes the current observation the next action and outputs the next observation so if i am here if i push my glass what will happen next so it predicts the future okay future condition on the action and from images now here is the procedure to side step this frontier problem first step is imagine a trajectory what does it mean imagine because you have a world model so you can imagine if i do this if i do that what will happen next so you can imagine a sequence okay then from this sequence you pick the sequence which is most interesting what does that mean interesting so interesting here means pick the sequence where your model is confused or uncertain so for instance let's say this trajectory here now this trajectory is completely inside the frontier which you imagine but this since it is inside the frontier the model will work really well and will not be confused so you will have uh, so you, you will have very low uncertainty about this trajectory so low uncertainty means that it is not very interesting you know about this already you sample more trajectories let's say this one now this one is outside the now this one takes you outside the frontier and note that all of these outputs that you are making may be completely wrong but all you have to say is to find a sequence of action which leads to scenarios which you cannot predict and to compare these two these two sides in one side you are saying generate a goal outside the frontier it's very hard in what we are saying is find a sequence of actions the outcome of which you are unsure about because that's a much easier problem i'm not saying predict the outcome all i'm saying is tell me whether you are unsure or not sure so we measure this via variance okay so here the model is unsure then what it does it, it picks its trajectory and execute these actions in the real world now in the real world the trajectory will be different from what you uh, what you thought the outcome will be because it was noisy so in the real world when we execute this it goes somewhere else for instance here okay then it then, then it has explored a thin horizon around this new thing this is outside the frontier 
but it's still not very good because you have to expand this whole area very quickly. Then what we do is we sample goals from this real world execution of the trajectory. So here are the uh, sampled goals. You sample these goals in the trajectory, and then you try to achieve those goals and practice to achieve them. This is the same as before. The goals were frontier at the frontier in the before. Now the goals are outside the frontier. And when you try to achieve them, you expand the frontier altogether. So very simple idea. Imagine, explore, achieve these three steps. And this allows the agent to discover uh, lots and lots of goals such that at test time, a new goal is given, the robot can achieve it very quickly. And this is a combination of achieving and explorer. So third, the first step is imagination and explore. That's this agent's goal. When you achieve the goal using this agent, and then at test time, you throw away this agent and then you use the achiever to achieve the goal given by humans. Let us see some results, like how good this procedure is for goal discovery. So here is this environment. So it's a pretty complex environment, the kitchen, and again, no primitives, etc. And here is a time lapse of the exploration. You can see that the robot is moving objects. And we are just marking here the interesting states it discovers. Now, we are not using only these states at goals because this requires supervision. We use all the states randomly sampled as goals, but here we are showing only for visualization, like the interesting goals the agent has discovered. So if you keep watching it on its own, it will move things around. It will uh, do interesting things like open the cabinet, etc. And you collect a lot of these goals through this procedure. And we test on many environments uh, like kitchen, bins, uh, this walker, and you can see this is, it is sampling interesting states on its own and then learning to achieve them. Now here's the interesting part. Uh, unlike previous methods, we, we are not bound to testing on one task in one environment. The agent is completely unsupervised and can achieve any goal. So at test time, by only training once, we show the robot lots of goals, like, can you make this shape with your body? Like these are the yoga-like shapes, we call it robo-yoga. Uh, can you make these shapes? Can you rearrange the block? Can you open the cabinet, turn on the light? Can you put turn on the burner? And all these many goals, okay? Let us see some results in the kitchen task, which is the hardest one. Uh, so let me skip these one, let me show the hard results. So here is a uh, uh, multitask result. Here, this is the initial image. And we show the robot this image directly. And you can see there are three things here. The kettle is moved from here to here, one task. Light is on, so you have to turn on the switch. Third is turn on, open the, open the cabinet. Robot has not been supervised, neither at training nor at testing. And here, it, here is how it does at test time. It moves the kettle, turns on the light, it opens the cabinet. This is doing all of it on its own. And this is outputting low level action. So it's a very long sequence, like right? to move the kettle, you have to move your hand there and then push it. So it's thousands of actions required to open this. Maybe not thousand, but like it's a thousand total across all these tasks. And it can do many of these things here. Mm -hmm. Open the cabinet and open the other one. Yeah. Anyway, so we evaluate this. Now the key part is that we only train once and test on many tasks. Note that this is not really solved right now, but I think this is a good first step towards this general problem, general purpose problem solving. So only our method can do lots of these things, while prior methods completely fail to generalize. Here is uh, Walker Yoga result where you can see this is torque control. Oh, I don't know what happened. Okay, so here it is making different shapes from its body. You can say, uh, uh, this is, since this is torque control, the robot has to keep applying torque to maintain the shape. So you can see that here, it is maintaining its shape. It is maintaining its shape by applying torque. Again, our method works the best. Then there is bins, rearrange the bins, etc. Here is one task of stacking. We showed the stacked blocks. And here you can see the robot actually is holding the blocks on top. It does not know that it should drop the block because it has not been supervised. It is trying to mimic the goal image by holding the robot. Uh, this, is, this is like a common sense error here. Like it's holding on top to mimic the image. So I really like this example. And we also did a single agent across all these tasks, like across the environment, a single policy. And uh, we evaluate thoroughly and this kind of uh, works well. Okay, 
So this was a uh, sub problem too, where within the same environment, we are training for diversity of tasks. So just to summarize the talk so far, in the first sub problem, we talked about online adaptation, where you adapt to diverse environment within the same task. Then we talked about self-supervised goal discovery, where the agent discovers lots of tasks on its own within the same environment. Now, if we want to achieve a long-term goal of general purpose embodied intelligence, we want the interaction between these two things, these two problems, okay, to achieve this long-term goal. But now know that this is not enough. Like you cannot just have uh, these two sub-problems interact and have achieved this goal. There also is a question of efficiency. Like we want the robots to interact in multiple environments, multiple tasks in a very efficient manner. And efficiency is a big practical concern, which probably is not there in theoretical. Right? And uh, to, to aid this practicality, there are many directions that we are working on as well. So for instance, towards this general goal and to make this process efficient, we, so far I was saying that, oh, the robot is not using any control stack, nothing else, no control, et cetera. But that's not a good thing, as in uh, we do want to use the knowledge people have acquired over the last 100 years in control literature and use that to make the robots efficient. But use the right ones. So for instance, uh, here is an example which we, which I have, uh, uh, which we're working on. Like if you look at the, all the robot learning literature in the works in the literature, you will find that uh, all these robots have one commonality. And that commonality is that all these robots are acting in a static environment, so quasi-static, as in they, the world does not change when the robot is acting. So robots can take thousand years to take one action and it does not matter because the world remains the same. In contrast, the real world is dynamic. Like humans move very, very swiftly and very softly, like throwing a ball, cutting with tables. And this has been studied in control literature for a long time for a single task, single environment setting. So we have this uh, uh, line of work where we take this work in control called dynamic movement primitives. It's like a uh, two decades of work and we put this inside a neural network in a differentiable manner. So state, DMP, output, and then we differentiate all through. And by including, by merging this learning plus control, we get kind of very impressive results uh, on a real robot. So here is a robot looking at the image and trying to draw this on a whiteboard. And this is the baseline on the left without any control embedding. And this is what on the right, like look at the uh, drawing from our robot versus the baseline. Both of them are correct, but the baseline is like a two year old drawing this while the eye is very smooth. Similarly here, uh, like pouring. So when your hand is uh, shaking and it's noisy, it's hard to pour. While in this case, our robot can just do it very smoothly. Very smooth and nice motion. Okay. Similarly, you need other things like building 3D reasoning in, in imagination. Uh, it, you need to reason in 3D space and not in 2D space. Uh, and that's what also we are working on. Like you want uh, the robot to be able to go from a uh, uh, single image and reason in the 3D space. So here is some of our result where we take the single image as input and we convert it into 2D reasoning um, without any 3D supervision. And I believe all these ideas have to come together to make this long-term goal uh, efficient and uh, practical. And there are many more such challenges which have to be addressed. Okay, so just some acknowledgement, the work uh, uh, done by these students, uh, like Ashish and Zipeng for uh, RMA line of work and energy, and then Russell and Oleg on his goal discovery, and then Chikhar on this control plus learning benefit. So with that, I would like to thank everyone uh, and take any questions.